各位佛友，大家阿弥陀佛。呃，我再一次问大家阿弥陀佛。再一次，大家阿弥陀佛。Okay, did you all pay attention to what you just heard? Three a m i t o f o s What's that all about? It's not immediately evident if you don't understand the Mahayana perspective. If you haven't come from the Mahayana perspective, that might seem a very strange ritual. But I guarantee, anywhere in Buddhist East Asia, uh, regardless of whether you're speaking Vietnamese, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Tibetan. If you put your palms together and happily greet another Asian Buddhist with Amitabha, you're going to get that in return. The name of the Buddha, Amitabha. This is guaranteed. Why is this true? In Buddhist East Asia, the name Amitabha has become very commonplace. Since the Tang Dynasty, this sound, these four words, Amitabha or Namo Amitabha. Homage to the Buddha Amitabha, the Buddha of Limitless Light, has become the dominant form of practice. Now, how deeply has Buddhist culture, particularly a Buddha who whose orientation is the suffering of death and ending its suffering, how deeply has Buddhist culture intertwined, has merged with the culture of East Asia? Can be seen in the use of this phrase. In let's say Taiwan, a place that I'm very familiar with, maybe also the same in Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore. In a Buddhist family, if you answer the phone, you say Amitabha. When you answer the phone, so Amitabha becomes Hello, right? And if you are a Buddhist in East Asia and you're saying the conversation is over, what do you say? Ah, ah, yes, yes. Ah, Amitabha. Ah, Amitabha. Ah, Amitabha. Amitabha. Goodbye. Omitofo means goodbye as well. If you see something scary, you encounter something on the street that's terrifying. You go Omitofo. <laughs> so Amitabha becomes Oh my goodness. The same time, right? Now I'm told. I don't know if this is true. I'm told in Hong Kong that it's exactly the opposite. When people see the Sangha, instead of saying what they do in Taiwan, Shifu Amitofo. Right, which is hello to the sangha. They say, "Hamitofa, here comes a monk." Hamitofa. <laughs> I'm told. I I just pass that on. I don't know if that's the case, but uh, often the monkeys in the hall, you know. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's often the case because there will be a, a hand reaching out for a red envelope, following the monk, you know, so or preceding the monk, I guess. So, now there's one guarantee. You can really see how much. The name Amitabha has entered Western culture. If you watch any kung fu film that features a villain monk, I'll give you a clue. You can see the villain monk has eyebrows that look like squirrel tails. You know, big bushy eyebrows, and he's got beads around his neck that would choke a horse. The beads are this big, right? <laughs> and he's got this big staff. Usually, the monk's staff. It's really big. And if you see these three signs, you know he's probably going to die by the third act. <laughs> And what does he say? He says, "Ha me to ha 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 ha." Right? That's that's the the buffoon monk, who you can tell by his "ha me to ha" that he's probably a, a loser. So, anyway, this phrase has a multi-purpose function. And yet, what is it? It's the name of a Buddha. It's the name of the Buddha Amitabha. My point is to say that. This particular aspect of the Dharma has permeated Asian, East Asian Buddhist culture so deeply that people take every opportunity to say the name. We don't let it slip. We want to recite the name of the Buddha Amitabha at every opportunity. I was speaking to a believing Buddhist laywoman the other day who said that in her she's already a grandmother. She's uh, uh, has been a Buddhist for a long time, but. In the last few years, she has undertaken a practice of reciting the name Amitabha ten thousand times a day, and she does it. She's got a, a little digital counter, <laughs> right? Om Nam Om Nam Om Nam. So, and she's not unusual. This, there's a whole community that supports this kind of practice. How interesting! What a phenomena! Isn't this interesting? 
Why are people reciting a Buddha's name to say hello, to say goodbye, to say, oh my goodness, to, to greet a monk or to uh, indicate uh, an identity? I think it's because, and there, there are scholastic reasons why, uh, it's interesting to note that in the Tang Dynasty, be before the Tang Dynasty, Amitabha was not the cult of, or the, the practice of preference, it was Maitreya. Maitreya worship dominated at the time of Tao An and Tao Sheng and, and the monks of the 4th century, 5th century. So there was a major turnaround and I'm going to suggest that there's a historical reason for it, which was life was hard. Life was hard, particularly in China, where this became the dominant form of practice. Um, for the average citizen, for Lao Bai Xin, there was no end to disasters. There was natural disasters, man-made disasters, a succession of floods, droughts, wars, bandit uprisings. Sometimes the soldiers and the bandits were indiscriminate, indistinguishable. They would take off their hat and become bandits and then t put their hat back on and become soldiers. Plagues came, locusts came, tax protectors, tax collectors, forced labor, an endless stream of suffering impinging on your body, which made life by and large miserable. The notion of a pure land, the land called Sukhavati, the land of utmost happiness, created by the wholesome vows of a kind-hearted monk whose name was Dhammakara Fazang, Dharma Treasury, sounded pretty good. It sounded like a really attractive alternative to what people were facing day in and day out. And how did you get there? Namo Omi Tofo. I return, I rely on the Buddha of limitless light. That sounded pretty good. So people did. People recited. Now, to take a step back into a scholastic perspective, you could say that this is a sacred story. If we borrow the, the word, the language of theology and, and folklore, that this is a sacred story. Amitabha worship and the understanding of the Buddha Amitabha is essentially traced to three sutras that uh, are not affirmed in other forms of Buddhism. We want to put that up front right away. There are three sutras that told the story of Amitabha and his vows. And essentially he said, let there be a pure land where there's no suffering. And people who want to go there at the end of life need only recite my name. That was the, the notion. So sounded good and people did and it became very popular. Now, uh, over the years, over the millennia, over the thousands of years plus, accounts flourished of believers who recited the name of the Buddha Amitabha and who then at the time of death went off to rebirth joyfully. Joyfully, not in grief, not in pain, not in fear, but often sitting upright, reciting the Buddha's name with a smile on their face and a heart full of light. Many, many stories. There's the Jing Du Lun, Jing Du Lu, right? It's, there's uh, uh, thick books divided into bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, upasikas, and others who at the time of death recited the Buddha's name and went off to rebirth. Thick, gathered testimonies over the years. And you may think, yeah, old stories, that's great. 21st century, what about us? Well, I'd like to offer to you personal experience. Um, when I was uh, working on my doctorate uh, in, in the early 90s, I would lecture at, in Burlingame, California. This is the northern end of Silicon Valley. Um, my parish, if you will, is uh, the East Bay of the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. I spend a lot of time in San Jose, Cupertino, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Menlo Park, Palo Alto. Uh, 